Hey guys, we're gonna read the first chapter of the Storm Runner right now. Here we go. It all started when mom screamed. I thought she had seen a scorpion, but when I got to the kitchen, she was waving a letter over her head and dancing in circles barefoot. After a year of being homeschooled, I was going to get to go to school again. Did you catch that word? Get. As in someone was allowing me to learn. Stupid. Who put adults in charge anyways? But here's the thing. I didn't want to go to some stuffy private school called Holy Ghost, where nuns gave me the evil eye. And I for sure didn't want the Holy Ghost shuffle to come all the way down to no man's land to pick me up. Mine was the last stop, and that meant the van would probably be full when it arrived. And full meant at least a dozen eyes staring at me. I smiled at mom because she looked happy. She took care of sick people in their homes all day. She also let her brother, Hondo, live with us. He spent most of his time watching wrestling matches on TV and eating bags of flame and hot Cheetos. So she didn't wear a smile too often. But I didn't know where to start. You said I could be homeschooled. For a year, she said, still beaming. That was the agreement, remember, a single year. Pretty sure that wasn't the agreement, but once mom had something in her head, it was super glued there. Arguing was useless. Plus, I wanted her to be happy, really, really happy. So I nodded hard because the harder I nodded, the more I got excited. I even threw in another smile. When? It was September. That meant I'd already missed a month of classes. You start tomorrow. Crap. How about I start in January? Yeah, you could say I was super optimistic. Mom shook her head in this incredible opportunity saying, doesn't a private school cost a lot? They gave you a scholarship. Look, she flashed the letter as proof. Oh, mom folded the letter neatly. You've been on the waiting list since. She didn't finish her sentence, but she didn't need to. Since referred to the day this jerk, a jerk whose face was sneered into my brain and hopped the, mopped the floor with me at my old school. And I had sworn never to set foot in any place of learning again. What about Miss Cab, I asked. She needs my help. How am I gonna pay for Rosie's food if I don't work? My neighbor, Miss Cab, her real name is Miss Calabaro, but I couldn't pronounce it as a little kid and the nickname stuck, was blind and needed an assistant to help her do stuff around the house. Also, she worked as a phone psychic and an I answered the calls before they came in on the line. It made her seem more legit. She paid me pretty good, enough to feed my dog, Rosie. Rosie was a boxer mation, half boxer, half Dalmatian, and ate like an elephant. You can work in the afternoons, mom took my hand in hers. Uh, I hated when she did this during arguments. Zane, honey, please. Things will be different this time. You're 13 now, you need friends. You can't live out here alone with these. Out here was a narrow dusty road in the New Mexico desert. Other than my two neighbors, there were tumbleweeds, rattlesnakes, coyotes, roadrunners, a dried up riverbed, and even a dead volcano. But more on that later. Most people are surprised when they find out New Mexico has so many volcanoes. Of course, mine was no ordinary act of nature, right, gods? With these, what? I asked, even though I knew what she was thinking, misfits. So what that Ms. Cab was a little different? And who cared that my other neighbor, Mr. Ortiz, grew a weird variety of chili peppers in his greenhouse? Didn't mean they were misfits. I'm just saying that you need to be with kids your age. But I don't like kids my age, I told her. And I learned more without teachers. And she couldn't argue with that. I taught myself all sorts of things, like the generals of the Civil War, the number of blood vessels in the human body, and the name of the stars and planets. That was the best thing about not going to school. I was the boss. Mom ruffled her, my dark hair and sighed. You're a genius, yes, but I don't like you hanging out with a bunch of old people. Two isn't a bunch. I guess I'd been sort of hoping Mom would forget our deal, or maybe Holy Ghost, who named a school that anyways, would disappear off the face of the earth and a freak catalytic mimic accident. Mom, I got real serious and made her look at me in the eyes. No one wants to be friends with a freak. I tapped my cane on the ground twice. 
One of my legs was shorter than the other, which meant I walked with a dumb limp. It earned me all sorts of nicknames from other kids. Sir Limps a Lot, McLimster, Zane the Cane, my all time favorite, Uno, the one good leg. You're not a freak, Zane. And oh boy, her eyes started getting watery like they were gonna drown in her sadness. Okay, I'll go, I said, because I'd rather face a hundred hateful eyes than two crying ones. She straightened, wiped her tears with the back of her hand and said, your uniform is pressed and waiting for you on your bed. Oh, and I have a present for you. Notice how she dropped the bad news with something good? She should have run from there. There was no point in my griping about the uniform, even though the tie would probably give me a rash around my neck. Instead, I decided to focus on the word present. I held my breath, hoping it wasn't a rosary or something. Mom went to the cabinet and pulled out a skinny umbrella-sized box with a silver ribbon around it. What is it? Just open it. Her hands twitched with excitement. I ripped open the box to get to the present and we di that we didn't have money for. Inside was a brown wad of paper and under that a shiny black wooden cane. It had a brass tip shaped like a dragon's head. This, I blinked, searching for the right words. Do you like it? Her smile could have lit up the whole word. I turned the cane in my hand, testing its weight, and decided it looked like something a warrior would carry, which made it the coolest gift in the universe. I bet it cost a lot. Mom shook her head. It was given to me. Mr. Chang died last week, remember? Mr. Chang was a rich client who lived in a grande house in town and sent Mom home with chow mein every Tuesday. He was also a customer of Mr. Cab's, Ms. Cab's. She was the one who had gotten mom the job to take care of him until he died. I hated to think mom was hanging out with dying people, but she always said we had to eat. I tried to eat less, but it was getting hotter and hotter as I got older. And I had reached a whopping five foot nine that made me the tallest in my family. I ran my hand over the brass dragon head with flames flying out of its mouth. He collected all sorts of things, mom continued, and his daughter said I should have this. She knew you, she stopped herself. She said the dragon symbolizes protection. So mom thought I needed protection? That made me feel pretty miserable, but I knew she meant well. I rested my weight against it. It per felt perfect and it made, was made perfect for me. I was excited to cruise around with this much cooler cane instead of my dumb plain brown one that screamed, I'm a freak. Thanks mom, I really like it. I thought it was going to make school easier, mom said. Easier, right, nothing, not even a warrior and dragon cane was going to make me being the new kid any easier. But it was a low point and I didn't think things could get any worse, but boy was I wrong. That night as I lie in bed, I thought about the next day. My stomach was all twisted in knots and I wish I could have turned into a pre-normal ooze and seeped into the ground. Rosie knew something was up because she let out little groans and nuzzled her head against my hand soft-like. I petted her white patch between her eyes in circles. I know, girl, I wimp whispered, but mom looked so happy. I wondered what my dad would say about the whole thing. Not that I'd ever know. I'd never met this guy. He and my mom had gotten, hadn't gotten married and he bounced before I was born. She only told me three things about him. He was superbly handsome, her words, not mine. He was from Mexico's Yucatan region. She had spent time there before I was born and said the sea is like glass. And the third thing is she loved him to pieces. Whatever. It was all quiet except for the crickets and my gut churning and then I clicked on the lamp and sat up. On my nightstand was the Maya mythology book mom had given me for my eighth birthday. It was part of a five volume set about Mexico, but this book was the coolest. I figured it was her way of showing me about my dad's culture without having to talk about him. The book had a tattered green cover with big gold letters on it the myths and magic of Maya. It was filled with color illustrations and stories about adventures of different gods, kings, and heroes. The gods sounded awesome, but the authors lie all the time. I opened the book and on the end papers was an illustrations of the Maya death mask made a crumbling jade and squinted lidless eyes and a square stone teeth like a gravestone. I swear the face was smiling at me. What are you looking at? I hopped and slammed the book closed. I tossed off the covers, got up and peered out the window. It was all shadows and silence. There was only one good thing 
about living on the Mesa is that it had 100 yards of dead volcanoes, AKA the beast. Having my own volcano was about the most interesting thing in my short life, up until that point, that is. I'd even found a secret entrance into it last month. Rosie and I were hiking down from the top. About halfway down, I heard a strangled gasp. Naturally, I went to investigate, half expecting to find a hurt animal. But when I parted the straggly creosote branches, I discovered something else, an opening just big enough to crawl through. It led to a whole labyrinth of caves. And for a half a second, I thought about calling National Geographic or something. But then I decided I would rather have a private place for Rosie and me than to be on the cover of some dumb magazine. Rosie leaped off the bed, and when she saw me slip on my sneakers, come on, girl, let's get out of here. We went outside with my new warrior cane, and I limped past Nana's grave. She had died when I was two, so I don't remember her. I crossed the big stretch of desert, zigzagging between the creosote, the octilio, and the yucca. The moon looked like a huge fish eye. Maybe I could just pretend to go to school, I said to Rosie as we got closer to the beast. The black cone rising a couple hundred yards out of the sand to meet the sky. Rosie stopped and sniffed the air. Her ears pricked. Okay, fine, bad idea. Do you have a better one? With a whimper, Rosie inched back. You smell something. I said, hoping it wasn't a rattlesnake. I hated snakes. When I didn't hear the familiar rattling, I relaxed. You're not afraid of another jackrabbit, are you? Rosie yelped. You were afraid. Don't try and deny it. She took off towards the volcano. Hey, I called, trying to keep up with her. Wait for me. I found Rosie wandering the desert four years ago. At that time, I figured someone had dumped her there. She was all skin and bones, and she acted skittish at first, like someone had abused her. When I begged mom to let me keep her, she said we couldn't afford her, so I promised I would earn money for food. Rosie was cinnamon brown, like most boxes, but she had black spots all over her, including her floppy ears, which is why I was sure she had Dalmatian in her too. She had only three legs, so she had gotten me and I had gotten her. When we got to the base of the volcano, I stopped abruptly. There in the moonlit sand was a series of paw prints, massive with long claws. I stepped into one of the impressions and my size 12 foot took up only a third of the space. The paw was definitely too big to belong to a coyote. I thought maybe they were bear traps, except that bears don't cruise the desert. I kneeled to investigate. Even without the moonlight, I would have been able to see the huge prints because I had perfect eyesight in the dark. Mom called it a sacred ancestral blessing. Whatever, I called it another freak of nature. They looked big enough to belong to a dinosaur, Rosie. She sipped one, then another, and whimpered. I followed the trail, but it ended suddenly, like whatever creature the prince belonged to had simply vanished. Shivers crept up my spine. Rosie whimpered again, looking up at me with her soft brown eyes and said, let's get out of here. Okay, I said, just as eager as she was to get to the top of the volcano. We climbed the switch trail back, past the secret cage, which I camouf camouflaged with a net of creosote, mystique branches towards the ridge. When we got to the top, I looked in the jaw dropping view. To the east, the glittering night sky rolling over the desert, and to the west, the lush valley dividing the city and the flat mesa, and beyond that, looming mountain range with jagged peaks that stood shoulder to shoulder like a band of soldiers. This was pretty much my favorite place in the world. Not that I'd ever been outside of New Mexico, but I read a lot. Mom always told me the volcano was unsafe, without ever really saying why. But to me, it had always felt quiet and calm. It also happened to be where I trained, after the doc said there was no way of fixing my bum leg, I spent hours hiking the beast, thinking I could make my shorter leg stronger. Maybe the limp would be less noticeable. No such luck, but the walking the rim's edge, I learned how to be the boss of balancing and that handy skills when you get shoved around by the kids at school. I set down my can and began teetering along the rim of the crater while holding the arms out to my side. My mom would kill me if she knew I did this. One slipped and I tumbled down 50 feet to the rocky hill. Rock, Rosie crushed behind me, cruised behind me, sniffing the ground. How about I pretend to be sick, I said. I still stuck on how to get out of Holy Ghost school. Or I could release rats into the cafeteria. There can't be school if there's no food, right? Did Catholic schools even have a cafeteria? The only problem was my idea would only buy me a day or two. A low rumble rolled across the sky. 
Rosie and I both stopped in our tracks and looked up. A small aircraft zoomed over the beast and turned and came back. I stepped away from the crater's edge, craning my neck to get a better look. I waved, hoping the pilot would see me, but he didn't come near enough. Instead, he started zigzagging like a crazy person. I thought maybe he, he was a baracho until he circled back perfectly for another run. This time he came in tighter. Just when I thought the pilot was going to pull up, he pointed the plane's nose towards the center of the crater. The wings were so close to me, I could practically see the screws holding them together. The plane thrust, shook the ground, sending me stumbling, but I caught myself. Then something glowing inside the cockpit, an eerie yellowish blue light, except what I saw had to have been some kind of hallucination or optical illusion because there was no pilot. There was a thing, an alien head thing with red bulging eyes, no nose, and a mouth filled with long sharp fangs. Yeah, that's right. An alien demon dude was flying the plane right into the beast's mouth. Everything happened in a sickeningly slow motion. I heard a crash and a fierce explosion rocked the world big enough to make even the planets shake. I did a drop roll as the flames burst from the top of the volcano. Rosie yelped, Rosie! And before I knew it, I was tumbling down, 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 away from the beast, away from my dog, and away from a life as I knew it. That's the end of chapter one.